So we're now going to talk about non-concurrent and concurrent collectors and introduce the differences between them. So if you recall, when we've talked about this before, when we talked about sequential streams, a collector is an interface that can be used to accumulate input elements into a so-called mutable result container. These implementations can either be concurrent or non-concurrent based on the various characteristics that they define. This distinction between concurrent and non-concurrent is really only relevant for parallel streams. As we've seen before, and as we'll see shortly, there's a, there's a difference that matters for parallel streams that doesn't really matter for sequential streams. You can use a non-concurrent collector either for a sequential stream or a parallel stream. Now that we've finished off our discussions of sequential streams in earlier parts of the course, we're just going to focus on parallel streams henceforth. So remember that a non-concurrent collector operates by merging its subresults. The input's partitioned up into chunks. Each chunk runs in parallel in the common fork join pool. And then these sub-results are collected into so-called intermediate mutable result containers, a list, a set, a map, and so on and so forth. Different threads operate on different instances of these intermediate result containers. And when they're merged together into a single container, each step as the tree sort of unwinds, then this is done cleverly so there's no synchronization required. Only one thread in the fork join pool merges any pair of these intermediate subresults. So we as programmers don't need to put any locks in our code when we use a non-concurrent collector, which is which is cool. It's very nice. However, there's there's a cost for this in some circumstances. So the issue here is that non-concurrent collectors will be thread safe. They can preserve order if you use data types like, like lists, for example. But for containers like maps and sets, it's costly because they have to merge these sub-results together. Therefore, we have concurrent con collectors. And concurrent collectors just create a single mutable result container, and then they accumulate the elements into it from multiple threads in a parallel stream. Once again, as before, the input is partitioned up into chunks. As before, the chunks run in the common fork join pool. And here's where things differ. The subresults from these, these processes that are taking place in the common fork join pool are collected into a single mutable result container, most commonly into one of the concurrent collections that comes out of the box, like a concurrent hash map, a, a key view, key set view, which is basically a concurrent hash set, and so on. Different threads in a parallel stream will share one concurrent result container. And therefore, as n gets larger, that is a win, as we'll see. And the reason why that's a win is because there's no need to merge together any intermediate subresults. The results are merged directly into the one and only concurrency-enabled or thread-safe mutable result container and therefore, we don't have to do any merging of things. And, and again, for collections that have expensive merging, like maps and sets, that could be a win as n gets big. Now, one of the things to note here is that encounter order is not preserved because we're doing this stuff directly into this con container, which is, is typically going to be a concurrent hash map or a concurrent hash set and so on. And the programmer or the collection most notably the collection usually, is required to provide synchronization because multiple threads will be adding stuff into this one shared instance at the same time. So this is actually a, a good example of the compromise that takes place in Java where we, we're trying to be functional wherever we can, but we're not always trying to be purely functional because purely functional wouldn't really allow this concept of mutable mutable objects, mutable result containers. You would want to have immutable collections, which would be unbelievably inefficient in this case. So in this particular situation, even though we all know that that uh, basically stateful processing is the root of all evil or shared mutable state is the root of all evil in concurrent and parallel programs, in this case, we just kind of bite the bullet for performance reasons and we use mutable collections, but we're careful to use mutual collections that are properly synchronized. And I've talked in other lessons about the concurrent hash map and how powerful 
that is and how efficient and scalable it is for concurrent processing. So it comes to our rescue here. So we can use it. It's very efficient. It's thread safe. And it's perfect to fit the bill for this particular example. Uh, we don't actually cover the concurrent hash map in as much depth as it deserves in this course, but I teach a companion course where we go into much more detail about how it works. So as we'll see, a concurrent collector may outperform a non-concurrent collector in circumstances where the merging costs are higher than synchronization costs. And as you might expect, as N gets big, that's where you start to see the benefits of concurrent collectors. So when N gets bigger and there's a high degree of overhead of merging for certain types of collections in those circumstances, then we would expect the concurrent collectors to start to outperform the non-concurrent collectors. When N is small or the collections themselves don't do merging, they just do say concatenation or appending with very little overhead, then we're not going to see that kind of a, of a win in terms of performance. In fact, you'll see it performs worse. As we talked about before, these concurrent hash maps can be more efficient than merging of hash maps. And the reason for that has to do with the implementation of concurrent hash map. A concurrent hash map is very, very clever in the way it uses locking. Each of the elements in the hash table uses something called a compare and swap operation on the linked list or the tree of elements that come off of the, the bucket into the hash table. And so as a result, concurrent reads can all run in parallel with, with no interference. Concurrent writes can run largely in parallel with just a little teeny weeny bit of locking when something is added. And so it's, it's just generally a big win and certainly a big win relative to other forms of synchronized collections such as synchronized maps, which only have a single lock for the whole map collection and therefore don't scale nearly as well as concurrent hash maps. So you might take a look at some of these other links that I have here if you really want to learn more about the difference between concurrent collections and synchronized collections in Java. Okay, so that is the end of this discussion. We will then go into more detail and show more examples of this followed by a case study.